Hey, this is a Hakawadi production. Hi there! I'm Nadia Michelle, and this is The Men's Room. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to the show so you can listen to all of our interviews with thought leaders from across the region. Today on the show, we have Shibli Malat, an international lawyer who has focused his career on seeking justice for political crimes and advocating democracy. He's worked on several high-profile cases that have included Ariel Sharon, Saddam Hussein, and Muammar Gaddafi. And he is also a former presidential candidate in Lebanon. Welcome to the men's room, Mr. Malat. Hello. So the philosophy of nonviolence, that's part of the name of one of at least 40 books you've written. Can you explain what that means? Yes, I was struck in 2011, following also a revolution here in 2005, the Cedar Revolution, by this extraordinary wave of uh, people going down into the street to question their government and get rid of them without weaponry. It was particularly striking in the Middle East where so much violence uh, takes place. And I wanted to understand it better. So at the time, I was teaching a course at the law school at Harvard. And one of the seminars that I conducted was about understanding nonviolence and law. And this slowly iterated into a book, which was published uh, three years later. And the book is an attempt to understand how nonviolence is displacing violence as the midwife of history. We're used to thinking revolutions with blood, whether it's the American or French revolutions or the Soviet ones or later ones, that blood needs to be spilt by the revolutionaries of their enemies uh, in order to prevail. And I realized that there's something extraordinary happening on the Arab streets where uh, the people are shouting non-violent, non-violent, and where they neither were capable nor willing to use weapons to shoot at soldiers or policemen or security forces. So I thought that was an important development in history, in the philosophy of history, the replacement of violence as midwife of history by non-violence as a midwife of history and I wrote the book accordingly. This was kind of Gandhi's strategy in some ways, or oh, is it of different? Course, yes. mm-hmm. So the idea that uh, I've invented the wheel is, um, is preposterous. Uh, nonviolence has been there, and the word obviously comes from Gandhi, who uses two particular concepts for this. One is called ahimsa, and ahimsa is a violence, nonviolence. And he has another word, which is satyagraha, which is the power of the soul. But I differ from Gandhi in a number of ways that I explain in the book, Uh, in particular in conceiving nonviolence as not only a method, uh, but also as a philosophy, in other words, as a sophisticated apparatus of change that includes the revolution itself. And that is where Gandhi has much more to say than I do, but also what happens after the revolution? In other words, how do we translate nonviolence when it's successful into a state and a society where nonviolence prevails? And that's the new social pact, the new social contract that people call constitutions. So all of these revolutions that have succeeded have in common also the search for a new constitutional order. And then, and this is what we see in particular in Lebanon, uh, emphasized is the need for accountability, for justice. In other words, the third part of the book is consecrated to understanding, so what do you do with dictators like Mubarak or Ben Ali when they fall? You obviously don't shoot them, you're nonviolent. So you have to find something else, and that something else is complex. Um, You have trials, that's in a way the simplest way, and we've had them in some ways in various places, but you have also other modes of accountability that are more complicated. For instance, the issue of corruption. So how do you get back money that was siphoned off by corrupt governments and supporters of these governments? So the book is a triptych, really, about nonviolence in the revolution, nonviolence in constitutions, and nonviolence in accountability justice. 
about accountability. You're, you are best known for winning the cases of uh, victims of crimes against humanity. For instance, the families um, and the victims of Sabra and Shatila. You had a case against uh, Ariel Sharon. You have a, uh, and which was at the international court. You've pursued a case against Saddam Hussein in 1995 which became the groundwork for the last case that was, um, you know, that really finished him off in 2005. And uh, very interestingly, I did not know this, you also were, uh, you represented the families of Musa al-Sadr, who, against uh, Muammar Gaddafi, Gaddafi who, uh, who was murdered or disappeared in Libya, um, which is still much talked about, I know, here in Lebanon. So... You have quite a track history with these kinds of uh, crimes against humanity types of cases. But when you're talking about these political revolutions that are happening now, um, and as you talked about corruption, is it uh, more difficult to um, to prosecute people or politicians in these kinds of situations because the cases are not as uh, emotional or not? Or do they apply differently legally? Like, can you prosecute these types of cases in um, international courts? You mean corruption cases yeah, as corruption opposed cases. to mass murder? Yes. Well, obviously, it's a matter of priority and it's a matter of moral choices. Uh, my sense, and it continues to be so, that physical crime is worse than siphoning off money. Um, but of course, people could say, well, you're killing a whole nation by depriving it from its resources. So it's a matter of choice. And in any case, I... I don't discard one for the other. I have a bit of practice in the cases that you mention, and they are pretty hard to prosecute, as you can imagine. But we're seeing it in Sudan, for instance, now. They have a dilemma in Sudan. Sudan illustrates well the point you're making. So Amar Bashir, dictator for 30 years, a general who killed so many people in Darfur and elsewhere, led to the destruction of his country, to the separation of the North and the South. So the deprivation of uh, the Sudanese northerners from the fields of oil that they had in the South. When the, revolution, when the revolution succeeded, it was obvious for everyone that he had to be made accountable for what he did. Now, this guy is both, and usually you have both. Usually when you have somebody like Saddam Hussein or Ariel Sharon, they are both murderers and they are corrupt financially. Right. So you have two grounds to go after them. In the case of Bashir, the new Sudanese government has put him in jail and they are prosecuting him now for corruption. So one easy example was they found, I don't know, $10 million in banknotes in his house when they arrested him. And of course, there's good reason to ask this guy, how does he have so much money there? And he could spend the rest of his life in prison. But from my perspective, um, the criminal dimension in terms of murdering people is at least as important. I would say really, for me, it would be more important to go after people who kill because the victims are very identifiable and these, are, these people are requiring justice. They want to see the person who killed their loved ones behind bar. Whereas in corruption, you know, it's the whole society. It's not quite as identifiable. And to that extent, um, Bashir was uh, is prosecuted and has been prosecuted for a while now by the International Criminal Court sitting in The Hague. And the Sudanese are refusing to deliver him to the court. So now you have this bizarre tug of war between Sudanese justice domestically and international justice uh, with the ICC. And we don't know what is going to happen, but both are examples of the kinds of dilemma that we're going to confront in all those revolutions that we are living once they have prevailed. Is it usually the country's government that, or people that uh, prosecute leaders for corruption? Or are these cases automatically brought to an international court? How does it happen? No, the international dimension tends to be more difficult. Uh, because there are all kinds of procedural problems and competence uh, that need, these are hurdles that need to be overcome that you don't have usually in domestic situations. But you see, and that's the problem we face in Lebanon. Domestic situations can only succeed if there's a new government and a new government produced by the revolution. So long as the old regime has its own judges in place, the likelihood of a big shot being prosecuted is almost nil, whether for murdering someone or for corruption. 
And I've been often asked in the past few weeks in Lebanon, we want to go after them. Can we do it internationally? Can we do it domestically? And my answer is simple, really, and it's a bit disheartening, but I believe in it. We can't do anything, either internationally or domestically, really, unless we have a new government that resembles us. There are too many hurdles procedurally for a victim to go after the person who harmed her if the government is against that person. So if we're still in the mode of the old regime, obviously the old regime did not have accountability, otherwise we wouldn't have reached the situation that led to the revolution. So the premise for any sort of accountability is for your government to be part of you, resembling you. And that's why in Lebanon, it's urgent that you have a new government because all this talk about corruption is going nowhere without a new government. What does that mean, a government that represents the people? Well, that's a much more than $1 million question. Right. Because you have in any revolution two tracks. You have the old constitution that continues to work and people are used to it. So we say, for instance, now, oh, we need a new government that is appointed by the president and confirmed by a vote of confidence in the chamber of deputies. Well, you have a problem. You have a chamber of deputies that the people don't like because it doesn't resemble them. And we have a president we'd like to get rid of. So how do we do a government? Well, sometimes the pressure is such that both the president and the chamber of deputies, and that's what's happening now, are being pushed into what they call, that is, they, us, the revolutionaries, are requesting, which is an apolitical, so-called technocratic government. In other words, people with a decent past who know what they're talking about that are different from the guys we have just brought down in the street. How to get them? We could have enough pressure on the street to have some sort of epiphany for the president to say, well, I'm going to call on a brilliant mind, preferably a woman for my, for my taste, uh, who is going to lead the government and leave that person, that, that uh, new lady prime minister, to choose the best people she can find, and then I'll accept it and we go on. And we'll have a vote of confidence and we have a new government with special powers, especially economic powers, uh, that tries to sort out the mess we are in. Why do you think the prime minister should be a woman? Well, before we get to that, let me finish the other course, which is the street has its own legitimacy. And that's why it prevented yesterday, justifiably, the parliament meeting over a crap piece of legislation. Which is basically giving immunity. Yeah, I mean, the idea of the immunity is ridiculous when everybody is asking for accountability. Right. So, it's a bizarre uh, thing to, I, you know, I don't speak Arabic, so I miss a lot of the details. But if from the outside, it kind of seems strange that that's the meaning they choose to have, is a meaning to create immunity so that people get, you know, let out of jail. And also they can be held accountable, right? Which is the side exactly. effect. Exactly. So, yes. And so they failed. I mean, they're so smart that they came up with the worst possible piece of legislation to put as a priority. What is the idea of prioritizing this type of legislation? In fact, it's a bit more subtle, but let's mm-hmm. stick to that and go back to that that point you made. Uh, so there is a different street legitimacy. That's revolutionary. And that needs time. And so it's not impossible, and I think we're starting to see it, that the street produces its own leadership. So in effect, we don't need the president to appoint a government. Slowly, we're going to have leaders, especially among the youth and the women who are at the forefront, saying, we'll see, we already know a few names that are attractive. And if those people come to power, we already know that the street will be acquiescing to them and be enthusiastic about them. But that requires some time. So I think for a while, we're going to have two track political problems in Lebanon, one that comes from what I call in that book constitutional ruins, in other words, the constitution as it stands, which is falling apart, but it leaves ruins that are hurdles. On the other hand, we're going to have a revolutionary legitimacy that the street produces, and we don't know what the result between the immense fight between the two tracks, which one is going to prevail and how. Why do you think... Nonviolent revolution is more powerful 
than a violent one. Is there a reason why it's so effective that can be kind of verbalized? There are empirical works from colleagues, in particular a book by a colleague, professor now at Harvard, she used to be elsewhere, who showed that studying a number of revolutions over the past 50 years, the likelihood of a nonviolent revolution succeeding is empirically three times as likely to succeed than a violent revolution. I mean, you have to read the book. There are arguments there. From my perspective, the importance is on a different level. And it's on a different level because a nonviolent revolution is one where we are not bringing down a government to replace it by a similar government. We are bringing down a government because it's a violent government. It's an unjust government. It harmed us. And that spirit that we are instilling in our revolution is one that doesn't want to see blood spilt in order to produce a new government. And I give you an example in the Arab Spring. In the Arab Spring, the greatest tragedy has developed in Libya. Because very early on in Libya, the revolutionists took up arms. And until now, they are in the mess. The country is divided in too many, so many different ways that it's a living proof that when the Libyan revolutionaries took up arms, they also were sowing the seeds of the post Qazafi era, which uh, era which was violent. And it's very simple. When Qazafi fell, the people in the street were all holding up arms and uh, and shooting in the air out of uh, of joy. Whereas everywhere else in Yemen or in Tunisia, when the revolution succeeded and their dictators fell, the people were dancing in the street without weapons. The fact of having militias being behind the fall of a dictator is an almost certain recipe for violence to continue because they have power and they're going to use it for their own interest. Whereas if the revolution doesn't have weapons, then the focus is altogether different and it's not going to use weapons that it has kept from the days of the revolution in order to force its own way for the people who have weapons in their hands. So the Arab Spring, not everyone considers... Um, what emerged afterwards as success. Do you consider, for example, what happened in Egypt, the aftermath, have they succeeded to effect what you've called radical nonviolent change? It was nonviolent, there was a change, but is it a radical change? No, of course not. And uh, I think it's more, it's more appropriate to talk about an Arab winter that followed the Arab Spring, and we're still living the Arab winter. Uh, But you see, the idea of looking at a revolution as a process that is just a few months is not correct. You have to look at it on a much deeper historical timeline. And what we see today in Algeria, in Lebanon, in Sudan, and we have three ongoing revolutions, which are extraordinary. And I would like to to stress that the revolution also in Iraq is nonviolent. A lot of people are killed. See, when we talk about a revolution that is nonviolent, that doesn't mean that the state is not violent. The, the government is can be terribly violent. We've seen it even in Lebanon, mm-hmm. you know, where some security forces are are beating up, and in the case of this poor chap uh, in Khaldi, killing him. Mm-hmm. So a revolution is nonviolent by the fact that the revolutionaries are nonviolent, not that the state or the government is nonviolent. The state and the government are always violent. Mm -hmm. And they are violent because if you could change them normally through elections, through democracy, then you wouldn't need a revolution in the first place. So that's very important to remember that a revolution is nonviolent by the fact that the revolutionaries are nonviolent. The state and the governments tend to be violent. So going back to Egypt and Yemen and uh, and Saudi Arabia and uh, and Syria the situation is is awful but you see when we say about a revolution we always have to take into account whether it's been successful or not i mean the revolution in Egypt was successful in removing mubarak but it wasn't successful in establishing a new social contract it wasn't successful in bringing mubarak to accountability That's why in the philosophy of nonviolence, you need those three elements. 
if you succeed in one and fail in the two, you have not succeeded. In Lebanon, we're talking about revolution. People are saying, no, it's a revolt. Well, it is a revolution. A lot of people are in the street. They want to change the system, but it's not successful. It will be successful when, one, the old order has collapsed physically, uh, and physically meaning that all these guys are going home. And when you say, كلن يعني كلن, all means all, everybody of these characters in politics should go home if the revolution is to succeed. But it doesn't stop there. It has to have those two other elements uh, pursued and pursued successfully to be a successful, a fully successful nonviolent revolution. There's also Iran, of course, now mm. that is, uh, the people are rising up there as well. Um, there are some who say that these spontaneous revolutions that are happening now are, in fact, the result of foreign interference. This usually comes, of course, from those who are at the greatest risk of losing their power and influence. Do you think there's been foreign influence in these recent uprisings in Lebanon, in Iraq, and in Iran? Certainly not, no. Um, I don't know enough about Iran. It's just started and we have zero news. But it's very simple. I mean, what power on earth can tell someone sitting in Nabatiye or in Tripoli in his flat, go down in the street and rally for the collapse of uh, the government? I mean, it's unimaginable. And it's a long story. I mean, in all revolutions, the French Revolution, for instance, there was a tradition of historiography that talked about the Masonic lodges behind the revolution. Any serious historian of the French Revolution will dismiss this as lazy reading of what's happened. And that's why revolutions cannot be predicted. I mean, there was a WhatsApp story, right? The WhatsApp story brought people on the street. You think somebody the, ta- the tax on WhatsApp? Yeah, that, that's you think that started at all? Yeah. Somebody in Washington or in Tel Aviv or in, uh, in you Te- never know. Why not? Tehran, it's possible that has conceived it's not that unfathomable. It is unfathomable. But if you look at what's happening in Iran now, it was a similar spark. They raised the price of gas. Yeah. So what it means, if it is fathomable, mm-hmm. it means that there is some brain up there in Washington that is looking at the situation in Lebanon. And telling Minister Mohammed Sheir on the 17th of October, listen, you know what you should do? You should raise the WhatsApp tax on telephones. And Mr. Sheir got the phone call from this guy in Washington whom he knows or doesn't know. And he immediately acted on it and said in government, you know, we have problems with revenues. Let's tax WhatsApp. And then that went down in the street. And at the same time, the guy in Washington was calling that guy who was sitting in Tripoli or in his flat in Beirut. You know what? You should go down to the street. It's not serious. It, it's, it means it that there is be, some sort of a be. genius up there <laughs> who is pulling. Even God is incapable of doing this. Well, some people think they have God on their side and they come up with some pretty clever ideas, I've heard. But um, Yeah, that's good to have God on one side. Mm-hmm. But I don't think, poor God, you can't ascribe to him uh, an interest in the WhatsApp tax. Uh, let alone you can imagine that some sh- schmuck in the CIA has the brains and the contacts to contact uh, Minister Sheir and tell him to uh, shoot himself in the foot with this and uh, yeah. and remain without sleeping for nine days, as we heard. It's a long shot. However, once it gets started, uh-huh. yes, then that's a different things story. are different. Yeah. So, of course, when you have a major revolution anywhere, There's interest in this country for this to succeed. And this country is not out there in, you know, we're on planet Earth and we have a region and we have... So people look very closely at what's happening. And at various points, they try to pull the rug towards their own interests. But that's very different from the idea that somebody has been conceiving and fomenting a revolution somewhere in the darkness of some... uh, of some building out there in Virginia. And so, yes, the revolutions, but even this is something where, you see, a revolution, the characteristic is to have a lot of people involved. Okay, So we have probably two million, two and a half million people in Lebanon involved in this. You cannot control it. You cannot predict it. You cannot uh, fashion it in the way you want you have a limited number of tools as a government in Lebanon and as a force outside Lebanon to influence it. And you will influence it in ways or the others. 
But even you as a very powerful government, let's say, you know, the Chinese or the Americans, you need tools to do it. How do you do the tools? The only thing that America has come up with in the last two weeks is that we are with the Lebanese people. I'm not sure they know what to do in order to support the Lebanese people. We know that the Americans would like, for instance, Hezbollah to be out, but they don't have a clue of how to go about it. And we in Lebanon don't have a particular clue of how to go about it. Do you have an idea? Revolution is a process. (laughs) well, if you're talking about this, yes, and but it's not. You know, there's nothing novel about this. I've always found that uh, that it's not normal for Hezbollah to retain its arm and be in government. And I'm talking about it as a lawyer, and I've said it time and again, uh, talking about violence. The definition of the state, the most remarkable definition of the state in the history of human thought, was by Max Weber, the great. Uh, German sociologist of the late 19th century. He said the state is defined by its monopoly on violence. So in the United States, only the United States can exercise violence inside the United States. And in France, only the French government can exercise violence. And that forms the country because once you step a meter outside the French territory, it's no longer the French, the German, the Swiss or the Spaniards who have a monopoly of violence over it. That's what constitutes borders. So it's inconceivable that a state would accept on its territory that somebody outside the state, outside the structure of the state, which is very sophisticated, exercises violence or has the right to exercise violence because it loses its monopoly of uh, what defines it as a state. Is there then some uh, legal process that could redesign the system in such a way where where you separate the political and um, the arms of a political party and and restructure that and incorporate it in the government in, in the yeah, same way you happened. would restructure a company? Oh, absolutely. And it's happened. You see, it's happened in 1989 with Ta'if. That was the agreement that the militia, and there were so many militias at the time, would leave their weapons, surrender the weapons, and some of them were uh, incorporated in the army. And I've heard myself at the time when Hezbollah was far less strong in 2005, its secretary general say the same. He says, we can find a way to integrate in the army and lay down our weapons. So it's not inconceivable. Actually, it's the only way forward. But at the moment, so long as, as they refuse to put down their arms, my argument is that they shouldn't be in government because it's a contradiction in terms. You cannot have a monopoly of violence for the state and the government, and at the same time have a mem- part of the government have its own system of violence, of violence issuing, as it were, or applying. So mm. you've so far dedicated most of your efforts in your career towards promoting democracy and human rights. Why is that so important to you? You could have just, you know, been a regular lawyer. There are all kinds of lawyers. Why was this your path and why are you so passionate about it? I remember that already when I was 15 or 16, I was a great admirer of of Amnesty International. And it was, you know, at that time, it was a young organization. I was in awe before those dissidents who were put in prison for their opinions, which I thought was and for those organizations that dedicated themselves to saying, you cannot be imprisoned for what you say. And that iterated, I think it's a part of any lawyer's uh, understanding that your client has rights. Uh, My clients have been victims of mass murder, have been disappeared people. And of course, they strike you more, they strike more of a nerve emotionally than, you know, a big corporation, even if the corporation loses a million dollars. Of course, you don't want your client as a corporation to lose a million dollars. But if they do, it's not like this dissident who's uh, rotting in in a cell in awful, uh, in awful dire circumstances. You're talking about injustice. Yeah, I mean, it's unjust also towards the cooperation, mm. if, but the type of justice that attaches to physical human suffering touches in me a nerve more than, than a cooperation. Let's go back to a question I asked you before, yes. which we never answered, which is why have you called for a woman to be prime minister in Lebanon? Ah, this is the most 
I think, the most fascinating dimension of our Lebanese revolution. Now, there have been nonviolent revolutions across the world, including, for instance, we forget it, but the whole Soviet Union collapsed and the Eastern Bloc in a nonviolent revolution in 1989. And there are other instances in the Arab world and elsewhere. Hong Kong today is a nonviolent revolution. What is remarkable in Lebanon is the clear, conscious, and creative leadership of women. So the first day of the revolution on the 17th, I was very worried that violence would develop. And there had been news that night of clashes with the security forces. And if that had developed, there would have been people injured and killed, and the revolution would have turned violent. And I'm absolutely convinced that a revolution that turns violent has minimal chances of succeeding. You know what happened the following day? The following day, when you had demonstrators down in Riyadh al-Salah, and opposite them, at the time, rather unhappy policemen and army people, there was a row of two, three women who were standing in the front and saying, men, go to the back. I mean, shouting, shabeb wara, young men, go back. And then we saw all these pictures of this woman who was uh, you know, assailed in, in, in front of Bank Audi, that famous icon, but a much more important one when the thugs of, uh, I suspect, uh, of Mr. Birri and, and Mr. Nasrallah came down, the women who stand up, who stood up to them. I mean, the pictures are, are... So the leadership is there. I'm just stating a fact. Women in Lebanon are in the leadership. And you had, you know, all kinds of other things. The human chain was mainly led by women. The women who went up to Abda, there were far more women uh, going up to Abda demonstrating than there were men. So that leadership is a fact. And unless it translates in at least a government which with parity, as they call it in French, uh, that is half women, it doesn't represent the revolution. In fact, you know, I'd be delighted to have uh, a fully female government, I think we would we would be far more efficient. Efficient and uh, also more in step with reality, perhaps, in terms uh, of, of uh, the, the laws. And nonviolent. And I mean, and it's all part of it. But it is, you know, it's, it's very moving to see that women leadership in Lebanon, because I don't know that any other place on earth in history had it so it's such an extraordinary i mean we we know the argentinian women of the of the plaza de mayo were absolutely instrumental but it wasn't that massive participation of women in in the revolution as we've had over the past month in, i just want to give my personal take on this i came to lebanon about four years ago mm. and one of the things i always talk about is how amazing the women are in this country there's there's mm. some truth to the fact of yeah. what you said that women are in the leadership in so many industries and i came from the u.s where you have you don't have these uh you know laws that are unequal against women and nevertheless here you really feel that they have a strong presence Um, it's interesting. It's an interesting mm. phenomenon. Let's t see if it translates. Um, but you speak of leadership. In 2005, after the Cedar Revolution, in which you were very active, uh, as you stated, you ran for president. That's right, yes. And as you probably noticed, I didn't succeed. <laughs> well, not that time. <laughs> that was yes. just the first time, right? No, I mean, you're asking me if I'm running for president? Yeah. No, definitely not. No. I think really... I'm very seriously uh, committed to a new, younger leadership, a female leadership. I think my time is past. So um, I think a lot of people would disagree, and I don't think that it's wise to have a group of leadership that's comprised only of young and new people. You need people who have experience who will avoid repeating the mistakes of the past because they've seen it happen before. When you don't have that, you're at much higher risk, I think, of making big mistakes. So you want me to do what? <laughs> well, I'm just asking. I'm sure a lot of people would uh, would support that. It's not a priority for me. Let's mm. let's put it uh, more modestly. Well, based on the information I know, I'm sure you would have a lot to contribute. So, I'm contributing. Yeah. I mean, I'm very involved, and I think you have a lot of ways to contribute, mm -hmm. like this uh, very interesting conversation tonight. 
uh, without having to take on a mantle of a political position, which is very constraining. Yes, but as you stated, there are three parts to a successful re right. revolution. And so to kind of wrap it up, you need to have the people who have the courage to step forward and uh, actually, you know, um, loop the loop, as you might say. Well, look, I mean, I'm, I certainly would like to see the end of the present regime. And I find it very natural to say that all these politicians and the system legally is simple. Uh, when you say all of them, meaning all of them, you translate it into uh, a law that says anybody who's been a deputy or a minister since 1990 should take a hike and not be in politics for 10 years. It's very reasonable. It's been done elsewhere If, you know, if an idea like this takes shape, we will have succeeded in ways that are quite remarkable. And that doesn't require uh, someone like me to be what a uh, president or a minister or it it's an idea require. that needs to take up, you know, take up in the street. And uh, in the same way as the idea that uh, that I'm happy to have produced uh, you know, four, four weeks before the, the revolution started that we need an apolitical technocratic government because the confidence in the political system has collapsed so much that uh, that only a non-political government in the sense of new faces of professionals to run the economy would be necessary for us not not to collapse so were you, you know were the you, idea is that mm -hmm. uh, you, you, um, uh, go ahead you, you produce ideas yeah. some take some don't take and there are two million people who are thinking and acting at the same time it's wonderful to be part of it Were you involved in uh, resolving the 2006 war with Israel? Well, I was involved because at the time, as you said, I was running for president. And the reason why we had the war with Israel is that, in my opinion, of course, you know, it's a matter to be decided further on the strength of documents and more research. But from my perspective at the time, I saw the war coming. I didn't see the war with Israel coming, but I warned that the deadlock in not being able to remove that thug we had as a president called Emil Lahoud would produce violence on a large scale in the region. And uh, we had reached a point where the only question domestically was the removal of Lahoud. Well, Hezbollah and Lahoud, not Lahoud particularly, went into that war and that made us forget the most important dimension that the 2005-06 revolution had developed, which is the need for a new president. And so, yes, the war was decisive in bringing an end to my campaign, because once you have the war, there's no campaign, and, uh, and instead you had the war. So when it started, obviously I wanted it to stop for all kinds of reasons, including to resume the campaign. But uh, eventually it stopped. The terms were... Uh, you know, we're good in the sense that we we no longer had a war, but the whole domestic dimension was frozen for a good, I think since 2006, the country has been frozen, so until now. Mm -hmm. So for 11 years, with a succession of bad presidents and uh, people who did not represent the street, uh, one of the major reasons for this was was the war. Well, you have a track record of success uh, with your legal cases. Um, Relative success, yes. Yeah, I'm sure we don't hear about all of the cases, but you've, you've been part of important cases and raised the uh, awareness around of those, which is already important. Uh, and then you've successfully won cases, which is key. And so you obviously have skills and uh, experience that are valuable in negotiating complex issues. So I'm going to ask you one last time, and in a clear, straightforward way, if... Um, you were encouraged and um, asked to participate in the in a new government. Would you accept? Certainly not if the current president is still in power, because the limits that you'd have as a minister constitutionally would be too strict and too constraining to be able to do anything. So I, I believe, yeah, if there is a new government without the current president... I would consider it, but I'd have to think through uh, really my family situation and the other people who would be on that government. Hmm. Well, I think that would be a good thing. 
That's very kind of you, <laughs> but I don't think that's the major problem we have in the country now. Well, there's a problem. I mean, when you speak to uh, people on the street, one of the issue concerns is that there's no real leadership. There's no one it's really right, in place. It's all right. It will come. There is no hurry. What's the hurry? So long as the revolution is non-violent. The hurry is that I think people want to feel that there's direction. And when you don't have leaders... I mean, you have people giving talks in the squares about ideas, but everything is kind of ethereal. There's no real direction of this is what we need to do. This is what we want. It's true. But again, in history of revolutions, the leader doesn't appear in 10 seconds. It's a process and it takes time and we have to be wise. And revolution are very creative and they create their own leaders. I'm not worried about that. It's just we are frustrated. We want it to happen more quickly. It doesn't work this way. You have immense challenges, very hard to confront. The street is obviously very creative, and being very creative, it's leaderless, uh, and it's not going in one direction. But so far, we've the revolution has been extraordinarily successful in Lebanon. I mean, it's brought down the Hariri government. It has brought down the, the parliament, preventing it from meeting twice. It has produced a fantastic lawyers' guild. It's created so many beautiful faces and voices and experiences. This is an extraordinary phenomenon. It's like time is leaping by light years in a matter of months. We've just been a month in this revolution, and look what it has achieved. Let's But part of what it achieves is a lot of frustration because we want it to happen more quickly. We want to have a government that looks like us in power. It will come, but it, it, it needs more work. It, it needs more time. Well, that's a generally positive outlook. So I think we should leave it on that positive note. Thank you so much for joining me. I really uh, feel privileged that you uh, joined us today. Thank you for your wonderful questions. Have a good night. Thanks for listening to this amazing conversation with one of the protagonists of current history. I feel so fortunate to meet people like Shibli Malat, and I also feel fortunate that I get to share it with you. Don't forget to subscribe on your way out. Have a good one.